Well, hi to everyone. Thanks very much again for coming to the People versus Corporate Courts Communities Fight Back, a webinar that's coming at the end of a day which has seen actions on streets across the country against corporate courts. My name is Leah Sullivan and I'm a trade campaigner at War on Want. We campaign for trade justice and right now in collaboration with our allies Global Justice Now, we campaign against ISDS. ISDS stands for Investor State Dispute Settlement or corporate courts, which we see as handing immense power to private investors over public policy and finances, as well as a serious barrier to be able to make the radical change we need to, we need to, to address the climate crisis. Apologies, I'm just gonna mute my emails and you're not getting those pings. Um, so I know many of you are already going to be aware, but I want to make sure that it's clear what we mean when we say talk about ISDS um, at the outset, what we often also refer to, refer to as corporate courts. ISDS is a provision written into trade deals and investment agreements that enables foreign corporations to sue countries if the countries take measures that affect the profits or possible future profits of that corporation. That can be including where those policies are taken to protect our climate and environment, to protect public health, to ensure the corporations pay a fair share of tax and much more. These provisions are written into thousands of trade and investment agreements and have been invoked over a vast range of policies. They enable investors to bypass domestic courts um, and sue countries in private arbitral tribunals outside and above national court systems for millions and billions of pounds. One of the most famous cases is the case of Philip Morris, in which the cigarette company sued Australia for attempting to introduce plain packaging cigarettes, saying it would harm their profits. A number of significant ISDS cases have involved the mining and extractive industries, just such as the case in which uh, the oil giant Chevron sued Ecuador um, after Chevron was ordered to compensate uh, people affected by an oil spill. They took an ISDS case against the country to effectively quash that ruling so they wouldn't have to compensate anyone. Or there's been a case against Pakistan in which the country was ordered to pay six billion US dollars to a mining company, despite the mining co company never having invested a single cent in building that mine. The result of these cases can mean huge financial payouts for corporations at the expense of countries' um, uh, public finances, but also have a chilling effect on policy, meaning that they discourage governments from taking policy measures for fear of having to face ISDS cases. Increasingly, we're seeing ISDS cases being brought over the policy changes that countries are making to try to reach their climate goals under the Paris Agreement. Claims and awards over fossil fuels tend to be particularly big and are getting bigger. You may have seen the news uh, recently that fossil fuel companies are demanding 18 billion from governments all over the world in response to climate protection measures. We're worried that unless we stop ISDS, this is the only the beginning. And um, one of these claims is uh, brought by a Canadian company, TC Energy, for 15 billion against the US government over the Biden administration decision to stop the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, these kind of cases are confirming the fears that we have that unless we abolish ISDS, states across the world are going to face huge compensation claims from fossil fuel companies over climate measures and maybe backing away from these critical measures for fear of ISDS claims. Um, so following on from a great event that GGN held a few weeks ago about two of these ISDS cases, um, which I'd encourage you to watch if you get a chance, we wanted to create an opportunity to hear about the communities um, and the grassroots struggles at the heart of two, two ISDS cases being brought by UK companies to shine a light on the, the, the destructive impact of the UK's position on ISDS. We'll be hearing from Maria Dorzogno, an activist and academic originally from Italy, who has been active in fighting against the Ombrina Mare oil field for over a decade. This proposed oil field is a subject of the current ISDS case being brought by UK oil company Rockhopper against the Italian state for over 300 million USD. And we're anticipating a verdict on that very soon. We'll be hearing from Aldo Oriana Lopez, an activist and journalist focused on environmental issues and extractivism and multinational companies in Latin America who works for Terra Justa in Bolivia. 
And finally, from Nicolas M. Peroni, an academic based at the Universidad Andres Bello in Chile, who researches the global economy, foreign investment and trade, and is the author of a recent book called Investment Treaties and the Legal Imagination, How Foreign Investors Play by Their Own Rules. So I'm going to hand over to Maria now, who's going to tell us about the community resistance to oil drilling that is the subject of the rock copper versus Italy case. Um, please type any questions you have for our three speakers in the chat so that we can have a lively Q&A se section at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to hearing Maria. Uh, yes. All right. So. Um... All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria, and the story I will tell you about right now is uh, involves the region of Abruzzo, where I lived uh, for many years when I was young. Um, and this takes place in Italy, and as you can see, right, central Italy, it's an offshore field called Ombrina Mare, and this uh, oil field was proposed at first by a British company called Mediterranean Oil and Gas, and later on it became the property of rock copper exploration. Uh, just to give you a few, you know, a feeling of where this story sort of uh, took place, and, and uh, this is the Abruzzo coastline where they wanted to host um, uh, this oil rig and also other kinds of infrastructure. So this is one picture, this is another, and as you see, right, it's pretty and it's touristic, etc. Um, the area was, there were many, many oil fields at the time, both onshore and offshore, and this started around 2008. Um, and this was part of also a larger, you know, set of uh, oil fields that were proposed all over the country in Italy. Um, Umbrina Mare itself came to, our, came to our attention in April of 2008. Uh, these were some temporary test rigs that this British company called Mediterranean Oil and Gas, uh, you know, started, uh, you know, installing in the, in the ocean, and people saw these things and they were very, very worried because we had no idea what this was going to be about. And it turned out that what the plan was, was to extract this oil at sea, bring it back to this uh, a ship that they wanted to anchor, and they were going to uh, operate uh, desulfurization processes at sea uh, 24 hours a day, every single day of the year with this, you know, perennial flame. And this would have been installed about five miles from shore. So it would have been completely detrimental to, you know, agri to, uh, you know fisheries, to tourism, etc. Um, the CEO of this company was called Sergio Morandi. He was CEO of both companies, both uh, um, uh, Mediterranean Oil and Gas and uh, uh, Rock Hopper Corporation. And of course, he you know, told everybody that they didn't anticipate any accidents, leaks, everything was going to be biodegradable, compatible with nature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, however, as soon as this thing was installed, they already started seeing you know, uh, some sort of minor oil spills uh, on the coastline. And so this caused you know, an unprecedented mass mobilization in Abruzzo. I was, you know, one of the sort of uh, persons to organize all this. And it was really something that this region had never seen before. We organized letter writing campaigns to the government. We had many, many public meetings over many, many years. Uh, uh, you know, I wrote this blog every single day where I would highlight stories of why oil is bad for us, why it's polluting, what it would do to our communities. Uh, the clergy took a big stance against uh, oil drilling, both onshore and offshore. There were many events. We involved schools. There was the news. We had protests uh, all over you know, the region. And again, this was a massive uh, you know, effort on the part of the people. And it was very difficult because you know, the politicians, at the beginning at least, were very much against stopping any of these uh, facilities. Uh, the press got involved. You know, we tried to make sure this was in the news often. Uh, you know, I wrote also some things on the national press. So, you know, it became this very big effort. Every time the oil people bought some kind of advertisement, we tried to, you know, counter with, you know, whatever instruments we had and we could. Uh, of course, it became evident over time that there was nothing biodegradable about these projects. In fact, they were going to use aggressive techniques, including fracking and using uh, a very toxic uh, chemicals, including these diesel-based fluids that, by the way, are forbidden in the UK. And so, you know, I would tell people, you have to be really, very angry because they're going to use these uh, uh, fluids that are drilled in their home country and they're going to come and use them, you know, in uh, Abruzzo with us. Um, and so this resulted in Italy passing, you know, against all odds, a first offshore drilling ban, ban back in 2010 that prohibited, in particular, uh, Umbrina Mar. However, these companies really insisted on, you know, going ahead with their projects because, you know, for them, it was a matter of money. And so they were very able, they were very good at uh, trying to bypass our victory 
factory. Uh, the stop to Umbrina Mare came in 2010, but they kept lobbying and lobbying and lobbying until in 2012, they were able to have the laws changed. And so finally in 2013, this thing was approved again. And so this gave you know rise to a long and complicated dance uh, between the people, the oil companies, the politicians, et cetera. But you know, we never stopped. And in 2013, about 40,000 people descended on the streets of uh, um, you know, the, the main town in, in Abruzzo. And this was again, an unprecedented thing for a region of this you know, relatively small size. Um, uh, this company, Mediterranean Oil and Gas, ran out of cash in uh, 2013, and they finally sold themselves to another British company called Rock Hopper Exploration, and this is now the target of this ISDS case. They kept the same CEO in charge, and the government, because of all these protests, decided to order a more environmental, uh, a more thorough environmental impact uh, report. And so we had to start all over again with, again, trying to talk to people, organize, etc. Uh, in May of 2015, there was even an even larger uh, protest of about 60,000 people that descended on the streets. And again, this was also uh, massive at this point because it involved also all the regions in Italy. At this time, oil drilling had become a big topic throughout the country. And uh, people understood that if they went ahead with Umbrina, maybe you know, they were going to also drill in their own, com own communities. And so this caused you know, a vast movement all around uh, the country. And uh, uh, in fact, in particular, uh, nine governors from different parties requested a national referendum against oil drilling. And so at this time, because again, the sentiment was so strongly against uh, oil drilling, the government decided to appease the protesters. And finally, in 2016, they decided to reinstate this ban against uh, oil drilling in the waters of Italy, including uh, that were also stopped this Ombrina Mare. And the result of all this activism, and it was massive, massive amounts of work behind all this, was that finally, Finally, in 2016, Italy passed this law that, again, uh, permanently forbade oil drilling in 12 miles in the 12 mile uh, uh, zone that you see here highlighted in uh, uh, in green. And uh, again, this was about 60,000 square miles of sea that is now, you know, uh, they're now subtracted from uh, oil drilling. And this was passed specifically to stop Ombrina Mare. And so we were all very happy about this. Ombrina Mare was finally dismantled between 2016 and 2017. But um, as you know, as you may imagine, uh, these oil companies really want to uh, go ahead and try to protect their interests. And so they, you know, in 20, I believe it was 20, um, 17, they filed this request to, again, the ISDS courts asking for about $300 million in compensation because they were not able to go ahead and drill whatever they wanted to drill. And uh, to me, this is particularly, it's a very terrible you know, piece of news because as I said, this was massive amounts of work on the parts essentially of volunteers. And we were all just trying to do what is best, not only for our community, but also for the planet, for climate. It was a, a wonderful exercise in democracy and the way this case has been handled, in my view, is terrible because the ISDS people never reached out to the community. Nobody ever came to Abruzzo or, you know, talked to any of us organizers to ask, you know, what the issues were, you know, how we, we experienced all this. It's like behind closed doors. We know nothing about it. And uh, again, it's profoundly anti-democratic. Um, and, you know, we don't even know, you know, they, they said that they would come out with a decision sometime in July of 2021, but no decision has been rendered. And again, it is a profoundly anti-democratic process. And of the three people that are supposed to decide on this, one, uh, and his name is, I believe, Charles uh, Ponce, some Swiss guy, he actually used to be a, cons uh, a lawyer for oil and gas companies. And so the conflict of interest is very, very thick. And uh, this is, again, a, a, a terrible thing. And I hope they abolish this ISDS as quickly as possible. And so I will stop here. And uh, there's maybe a minute or so uh, uh, if there's any questions or anything like that, or else I'll just give it back to Leah. Thanks, Maria. That was a fantastic, a fantastic uh, overview and within the time limit, which is always super welcome when we have a, a busy agenda. My visible to everyone. Um, so to add to what Maria has said here, uh, I'll stop the share. That enforces the now? judgment. 
Sorry, can you hear me? Um, so, yeah, just to add to what Maria has said here, uh, Rock Hopper brought this case under the Energy Charger Treaty, yep. which is um, the single most used treaty for ISDS. It is an agreement from the 1990s that provides investment protection for the energy sector and is being used to sue countries for taking climate action, including through, uh, through the, the case against the Netherlands for, for collectively for 3.5 billion um, over their plans to phase out coal fired electricity generation. It's really alarming in particular that the rock copper case uh, could be taken, uh, was able to go ahead because while the UK is still a full member of this treaty, Italy has actually already left the Energy Charter Treaty, but could still be sued under so-called sunset or zombie clauses, which mean that countries can still be sued for up to 20 years after they, after they leave the ECT. It's also incredibly worrying that while there is already sort of 57 members of the Energy Charter Treaty, some of whom have expressed a desire to leave the treaty because of the threat of climate action, the Secretariat, Secretariat of the ECT is uh, is on a membership drive across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, encouraging countries to join this treaty that is going to open them up to these kind of bank breaking claims. And so cases like these are uh, kind of the clear reasons why we're demanding that the UK leave the Energy Charger Treaty. I think there is a, uh, a link in the, in the chat to the petition against the Energy Charger Treaty. Um, and uh, in this case, we see that there was a successful sort of community uprising uh, against this against this case. And often ISDS cases are brought against these community um, sort of grassroots movements, anti-extractive movements, um, which then leads to uh, our next speaker, Aldo, who works for Terra Justa, and he's gonna put into context for us um, the new ISDS claims that have been brought in recent months against Colombia through the UK, Colombia, and Swiss Columbia bilateral investment treaties um, by mining company, companies Anglo American and Glencore, we are, who are um, taking action, um, making a claim against Colombia over a national ruling which has limited their ability to mine for coal under the uh, under a river there. So take it away, Aldo. Muchas gracias, eh, Lea. Eh, buenos días a, a todos. Thank you very much, Lea. Gracias a Hi to everybody. Thank you to Global Justice Now and Warren for the, for the invitation for Terra Hosta to speak on this case, on this issue. My name is Aldo Orellana. I'm part of Terra Hosta. We work and support cases and resistant processes uh, to extractivism in Latin America. And uh, usually uh, affected by uh, dynamics of corporate power, including ISDS. I'm going to share my screen so we can uh, see some images. So I'm going to focus on, on Latin America uh, based on our experience at Terra Justa. So what we can see in our region is that extractivism uh, and these uh, ISDS cases go hand in hand, which is, of course, is related to the climate crisis. Multinational companies are pushing uh, mineral extraction, oil extraction, coal extraction in the whole region, in campesino and small farmers and indigenous uh, communities who have no alternative uh, but to resist the territory is part of their uh, means of uh, existence. These in very few cases, uh, these resistances have been able to block extractive projects. Whenever the companies lose on the turf of the uh, local communities, they shift the struggle to the turf of uh, these, uh, these um, arbitration tribunals, as Leia, uh, Leia at the start. So as you know, when this happens, the companies in general use these cases as a way of blackmailing uh, governments to allow them to develop their extractive projects. Uh, I emphasize extractive projects because a large part, if not the majority of these cases in our region at least, 
have, are related to control of natural resources and are also related to y lo que sucede es que las empresas y los gobiernos eh, presionan a las comunidades ¿no? que, que pongan estos proyectos muy pocas veces so the and the governments pressure the communities who are trying to stop, stop block these projects it's very rare in the region for the governments to be on the side of communities uh, the demands of the communities in general the governments uh, are on the side of uh, yes, yes. the companies. A few examples, uh, El Salvador is one of them where all uh, mineral mining has been uh, banned in, a nat in national legislation. That's just by means of introduction. This whole issue of extractivism has everything to do with the climate crisis. Struggles, the communities, struggles, in the territories to block um, oil exp exploration or, or coal exploration are, of course, um, climate-related struggles. On, in our work in the region, whenever we speak to local, local community people, they talk about uh, protecting the territory, so avoiding coal extraction or oil extraction. But of course, uh, that means uh, struggling uh, against the climate crisis. It's just by means of introduction now, before I talk about the specific case that we're here to talk about today, which is uh, the case of Anglo-American and Glencore against Colombia, as was mentioned at the start. In summary, uh, between May and June 2021, Anglo-American and Glencore uh, initiated ISCS cases against Colombia for not allowing them to extract coal from the bed of the, uh, the Bruno River, uh, a source of water, a very important source of river for ecosystems and communities in the La, La Guajira region in the north of Colombia. It, that, that region is where the largest uh, coal open pit coal mine in Latin America is located. It's called Cerrojón and it's owned by Anglo American, Glencore, and BHP. By means of context, uh, what is the, the Cerrojón mine? This photo uh, is one that we took uh, in 2017 uh, in, in the area. But just a few basic details on Cerrojón. It's the largest open pit coal mine. In Latin America, as I mentioned, it's, it's owned by those three uh, major multinational corporations, Glencore, Anglo-American, and BHP. Although we know uh, just recently that Glencore is buying out Anglo-American and BHP. It is approximately 700 uh, square kilometers. Um, 30 million tons of coal uh, on average is extracted per year, although it has been re reducing in recent years. And most of this coal is destined to be exported mainly to Europe. So for decades, the communities and civil society organizations, uh, national and international, have documented uh, human rights violations and uh, it, the impacts on the environment and on the communities in the area. So over 30 communities have been displaced, uh, both Wayu indigenous and afro descendant communities uh, with really major cultural uh, consequences. Coal extraction has led to environmental degradation of the soils and the water sources in the air and of course in people's health. So for the expansion of the mine, this is, has everything to do with the ISDS case. It's, for its expansion, Cerejón has um, diverted 19 rivers or, or streams in the local area, including the, the Bruno River, uh, a really important tributary of the Rancheria River, and, uh, one of the most important in the La Guajira region. Just to highlight that all of this uh, detail, all of this research, um, it's not just their own, but it's also based on uh, nat national Colombian and international organizations who worked uh, on the region for many years uh, closely with the local communities. I just want to mention the Colombia Solidarity Campaign and the London Mining Network, um, a network that Terra Justa is part of, as well as Iwan Want and Global Justice Now. 
uh, just to highlight their work. Um, to the participants who would like to look into this issue further, the London Mining Network is a really great place to begin. They've uh, worked really closely with communities for many years, and uh, including activities around the AGMs of the companies in London. Just a little bit more on the, the diversion of the Bruno River. So since uh, 2013, Serocon company has, um, had the, has intended to uh, divert the, the Bruno River uh, to develop the, uh, the La Puente uh, bed. So what they did was they diverted the, the river, uh, they moved the, the course of the river 700 meters to the north from its original uh, location. So what the companies did was they, or what the communities did was they, um, they brought a case uh, to the Constitutional Court in, in Colombia. The Constitutional Court uh, in, a, in a ruling in 2017 uh, ruled that several community rights had been uh, violated, including uh, the right to water, food sovereignty, and health rights, um, by uh, diverting the river without consulting the communities in order to extract, uh, expand coal extraction. So, uh, like uh, um, until today, the company has not uh, re-established the course of the river to its or original course. Um, as was established in, in that center, in that uh, court ruling. So this is where the whole, thing, the whole issue of the ISDS case uh, comes up, um, of uh, Anglo-American against Colombia and Glencore against Colombia. So just, uh, in, in the space of just a few days, both companies uh, brought ISDS cases against Colombia uh, using the argument that the decision of the Constitutional Court that blocked Serifon from uh, developing the La, La Puente pit and extracting coal from the bed of the Arroyo River affected their, negatively affected their, their investments uh, and in violation of the bilateral investment treaty. In the case of Glencore, the bilateral investment treaty between Colombia and, and Switzerland. And Anglo-American brought their case, but their very similar case against Colombia using the bilateral investment treaty between signed in 2010 between Colombia and the UK. So the, the ICSID, um, International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes of the World Bank, uh, still haven't revealed the specifics of the clauses of the bilateral investment treaties that have been violated in the cases. Just begin to beginning to wind up. But what is what is the significance of this ISDS case? So I think I think it's really important to uh, to understand what's going on here. So firstly, uh, the social organizations and the communities in, in the La Guajira region have struggled uh, to um, raise awareness um, and, and uh, to seek accountability for the impacts of coal mining in their territories. And the constitutional court ruling is the result of that uh, struggle. So they're using the democratic uh, institutions of Colombia. So th what, what does the company do? Uh, it goes above the democratic institutions of Colombia um, and brings this ISDS case against Colombia. Secondly, um, these uh, disputes should be resolved in, in national courts. Anglo-American and Glencore are using this international legal infrastructure provided uh, by bilateral investment treaties and trade agreements as a way of black, uh, blackmailing the communities. And it's a way of communities that have caused uh, incredible damage over many years. Uh, 
Anglo American, for example, uh, wants to leave, wants to get out of uh, this, uh, get out of Colombia, and, and this this is a way for them to do that to break with the history of the impacts in the case. And I think these these cases are really important for international climate movement. In this case, the the, the Colombian these, the Colombian communities are fighting to prevent uh, coal. Uh, the expansion of coal extraction. And just by means of uh, conclusion, in this instance, an ISDS case is, is preventing communities from uh, leaving the coal in the ground. This is so important in the climate struggle. There, there are many other cases, like the one in, of uh, Chevron in, in, in Ecuador. It's a company, it's a little bit different. It's a, it's a company that extracted oil in, in Ecuador and the Amazon for many years and then left. When the communities um, managed um, to, uh, to achieve a ruling in the national courts uh, for to hold the company accountable, accountable for the damages, uh, the Chevron uh, resorted to uh, an ISDS case internationally, going above uh, the national courts. And then finally, we have been looking at cases uh, in in mining, in particular in Peru. Uh, quite often, people don't make the connection between uh, metal mining and and climate. Uh, this, uh, like minerals like gold and silver are not burnt, but the climate crisis is is very much related. It's uh, making this, uh, the conditions of these communities uh, worse, and the companies, uh, instead of instead of repairing the damages they've done in these communities, um, they are using the discourse of of the, the energy transition uh, because they're producing uh, metals that are used in the energy transition. I think it's really important to make those connections. Uh, currently in Peru, there's a debate going on, and there's a resistance movement. That could very well uh, manage to, you know, get rid of these companies uh, like Glencore as a presence there too. But that's this, this is what will happen again. Glencore will uh, will will bring uh, more cases like this. Uh, Chile is another case where they have many bilateral investment treaties and trade agreements that leave them open to these ISDS cases in the future. Thank you very much for your Thanks, Aldo. Uh, that was great. Um, I'm going to move on without much more ado to our final speaker. Um, but as, as, we've, as we've heard from Aldo, we have these incredible cases of ISDS cases being taken in context where these corporations have already exploited and uh, displaced communities for, for decades and decades. And when we hear about these cases, and as campaigners, when we talk about these kind of cases, we're met with sort of incredulity, like, why do we have the system? Why on earth would countries sign up to it? And how can we put a stop to it? And that's why I want, I'm happy to introduce you to Nicholas, who's going to, um, demystify a little bit for us the origins of this regime. So uh, whenever you're ready, Nicholas. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry, here we go. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lea, and, and, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for, for the invitation and, and thanks to Maria and Aldo as well for the the introduction um, and, and the discussion of the important cases in, in Italy and, and in Colombia. So yeah, actually, so what I'm gonna do is move us a little bit uh, back to the 1950s, when I think we can locate uh, the origins of uh, in what we call today ISES and investment treaties. So, uh, I mean, International law has a, lot, uh, a long tradition of protecting foreign investors, and this probably goes back to the origin of modern public international law, European uh, international law, colonialism, 
diplomatic interventions and military interventions in the 19th and, uh, century and, and, and the early 20th century. But the specific origin of, of uh, investment treaties and ISDS, uh, I think, can be located in the, in the 1950s. So here in, the, in this picture, we can see uh, the Lord Privy, uh, Robert Stokes, and Hartley Shawcross. Hartley Shawcross is the, smile, the gentleman that's smiling on, 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 on your right on the screen. Uh, back then, he was uh, the president of the uh, Trade uh, Association in, in Britain. And they, they were meeting here in 1951. There was an emergency meeting to discuss the consequences of uh, Iran's uh, nationalization of oil. Um, the, um, this was not the only nationalization that occurred in the 1950s. It was followed by uh, the nationalization of the Suez Canal in 1956 in Egypt, and uh, the Indonesian nationalization of uh, Dutch investments in 1958. So these different uh, events kind of created a sense of uncertainty for foreign investors who were uh, worried about the future of their projects. In Guatemala, uh, there was an attempt to uh, pursue an important agrarian reform in 1954, that was uh, boldly opposed by uh, the United Fruit uh, Corporation and then the United States um, intervened in Guatemala using its uh, army to stop that and, and remove the president. So this situation created a sense of uncertainty and as, as I was saying, and, and investors uh, decided, sorry, and, and investors decided to organize and, 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 and move and, and, and make their concerns, uh, uh, to organize and, 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 and focus on, on, their, on their concerns and their worries. So this, uh, at the end of, of the Second World War in 1949, the National Chamber of Commerce had a, an initiative uh, for, a, for a code of conduct for, that governments should comply with uh, that was called, named the Code of Conduct for, foreign, uh, for the Fair Treatment of Foreign Investment. That Code of, that code of Conduct already contained uh, investment, like the, the sort of, you know, uh, provisions we find in investment treaties and the possibility, the possibility to use arbitration. But then the U.S. government and, and, and many other governments were, were worried about pursuing this project also because uh, of decolonization and, the, and the, the pressure that global South countries were uh, exercising and uh, the communist threat, something that the U.S. was very concerned about, the possibility that countries would just join uh, the communist bloc. Uh, but investors were not, uh, uh, they, they, ju they just continued. And, 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 and after they saw these events in the 1950s, they organized, as I was saying, and here we see uh, the one director of the Deutsche Bank, his name was Hermann Abs, who was also a, a, a director of Deutsche Shell. And he organized a, a group of uh, investors in, in Germany and created a society to promote the protection of foreign investment. So he, one of his important uh, initiatives was called the Magna Carta for Foreign Investors. And uh, he went to the IIDC, which, he, which was a, a meeting organized every four years in the US in San Francisco. IIDC stands for the International Industrialization and Development Conference to present the, his Magna Carta for Foreign Investors to the US uh, audience and to call for investors all over the world to join him and, and unite. His point was basically the following. The, gov the war needed development and, and international aid was not enough to promote that development. So foreign private investment was amassed, but that investment would only occur if those investors were protected. So he, will say, he would say that there was a humanitarian mission for investors to promote development, but for that to happen, governments should uh, commit to protect their uh, investments. And uh, his point basically was, what we need from uh, governments is strong rights and a strong remedy. So the strong remedy was, as Aldo Maria was saying, investor state dispute settlement. 
the ability to sue governments with, uh, directly through arbitration without having to exhaust local remedies. And the imagination that, that is behind the rights, just to illustrate that, that to you, is, is one that wants to place investors not in a regulatory relationship with states, but rather in a sort of equal relationship, like if it was a contract. So imagine if you are moving from one country to the other and you are an immigrant, you have to comply with the rules of those countries. You, can, you don't get to choose which rules you want to comply with and which rules you prefer not to comply with. And uh, governments may change the rule, those rules and there's pretty much nothing you can do about it. But if you are an investor and you can uh, use investment treaties on ISES, the relationship is a bit more like a contract relationship in which it doesn't really matter what are the roles of that government. If you get to uh, you know, negotiate your own rules or, or if you get to get uh, certain uh, privileges, like, I don't know, for instance, you get a license to uh, drill oil. And what happens later doesn't really matter to you. You still can get your rights uh, enforced because you are in this equal relationship as if it were a contract. This is quite unique and, and really uh, uh, uncommon, you would say, most uh, legal systems. So uh, Abs was there in San Francisco in 1957 presenting his project, and he got the support of many uh, business people who attended this event, including Henry Luce, who was the, the uh, editor-in-chief of the Life magazine and the Times uh, magazine in the US. So Luz and Abs had something in common. Not only they were uh, worried about decolonization and, and the threat of nationalization, they were also very unhappy with uh, Keynesian policies. So they're, in their views, government should not intervene in the economy, government should not promote state, comp uh, state companies, and government should not uh, nationalize. So for Abs and others, uh, countries in the global north, by nationalizing, like in Britain, railways and other, uh, and other sectors, they were giving countries in the global south a very bad example. So they also were calling on go governments in Western Europe and the US to stop uh, these policies. And, and this is a bit of the, the, the beginning of the project of investment treaties on ISDS, and apps Magna Carta in a way developed later into investment treaties. But what happens is that uh, governments uh, were not so sure about what APPS was proposing. Um, the question was, uh, when, when Germany signed the first bilateral investment treaty in 1959, they did not include IESES, because they thought this could end up uh, giving too much power to, to foreign investors. And on the side of the US, as I was saying, the US was concerned that governments would feel too much pressure to protect foreign investment, and they would decide to join communists, uh, the, commun the Soviet Union and, and, and the communist ranks. And then they, they were really worried about that possibility. But investors uh, did, not, uh, they, they did not stop with that, and they rather continued and organized to promote treaties uh, and ISDS. So uh, Abs and Chokros, a person you saw in the first slide, so a German uh, banker and a, and a British uh, lawyer who now was uh, the chief counsel of Shell, got together and organized the International Association for the Protection and Promotion of Private Foreign Investments. This organization uh, was based in Geneva, we can call it the Geneva Association. And there was a group of different foreign investors who got together to promote treaties and IES, yes, to lobby countries, to lobby the OECD, the World Bank, to get uh, IES, yes, into investment treaties and, to, uh, and for the creation uh, of the International Center for uh, the Settlement of Investment Dispute, or ICSID, that, that uh, um, Aldo was referring uh, earlier. So the members of, of the, this Geneva Association included the most important oil companies, who were in fact the, the firms that were more interested in getting investment treaties and, and ISES, because most of the nationalizations occurring in the 1950s and, and, and 1960s had to do with oil and natural resources. So Standard Oil of New Jersey, currently ExxonMobil, was a member, and also the law firm that was represented its interests, Shell, represented by Shawcross. And the other logo you see there is the logo from the Compagnie Française de Petrole, uh, currently Total. 
So the three and other firms uh, like Rio Tinto were part of this organization who were do involving, it was, uh, let's say, a, a sort of a lobbying group uh, and who was like constantly in contact with, with, with the OECD, the World Bank and, and, and governments. And, and Shell in particularly was involved in promoting ISES and investment treaties um, through this uh, organization. So you can see here, like in, despite the, the, the resistance of governments, even in the North that, that were not so sure about it, investors organizing and trying to pursue this, the, their project. Now, I think it's interesting to, so to, to think uh, or to see what other people thought about it. I mean, definitely in the Global South, these, these projects did not have a lot of uh, support. But even in the, in the, in the North, uh, uh, academics and governments, as I was saying, were worried. So here we see uh, ex, uh, two passages from a book by Stanley Merger, Metzger, sorry, who was an, a, a, a U.S. academic, and he referred to the draft convention, and that is the Abs Chocros draft. So uh, Abs Magna Carta was then merged into the project that Chocros had in mind, and that was uh, called the Abs Chocros draft. This is the draft convention, with Stan, which Stanley Metzger described as a as a non as a non starter and a, an unrealistic code of uh, private foreign investment. And in, in Britain, uh, uh, George uh, Schwarzenberger, who was, had the chair of international law at UCL, had a similar view. His point was that the project was too biased, rights for investors, no obligations for them, no rights for states. And, and he, he said that it was kind of, uh, the project was pre pretty much catering the needs of uh, oil firms, particularly Shawcross concerns uh, uh, and for uh, shell investments in uh, uh, most uh, of the global south. So the position actually, so these people were actually, if you see, uh, uh, promoting their views despite uh, some uh, significant resistance, you could say. So this is a picture from 1963, a meeting of the International Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Com the ICC, had decided to uh, drop its own 1949 code of uh, foreign uh, fair treatment for foreign investment and supported the abstract cross draft. Here you see uh, show, uh, apps, the gentleman in the middle is uh, Otto Wolf von Amerongen. He was the, the, the president of the ICC Germany, who was also speaking uh, often in favor of uh, investment protection and the need for arbitration. And, and the, the other, the gentleman on your right is uh, was David Rockefeller. He was the press, He was a banker, and he was uh, deeply involved in in, in in the oil business through uh, uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey. So these meetings serve to keep promoting the idea of protecting foreign investment through treaties, through ISDS, despite the resistance of, of governments, uh, and eventually. Some of these things uh, work out quite well because in 1965, the World Bank decided to create uh, the World Bank created the exit. I mean, this was a process that went from 1961 till 1965, but still governments did not include ISDS in their investment treaties. This would change in 1969. When, the, uh, it, when Italy signed the first investment treaty with ISDS, granting the remedy to investors. So investors have their rights, but not this ability to sue governments directly without exhausting local remedies. This privilege that is unique in the world even today, because you don't have that uh, privilege in, 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 in human rights uh, treaties, was... Uh, finally consolidated in that treaty that Italy signed with Chad in 1969, that using that together with, with, with ICSID allows then investors to sue uh, governments directly. 1969 is still an interesting point where, because government, because investors manage these normal entrepreneurs, if you want to, these oil uh, investors and, and, and some lawyers, manage to get this, uh, the, the, the system together but at the same time, there is a, an important backlash against multinational corporations that would last on uh, during two all, I mean, throughout the 1970s. So if you see here, when uh, in, the, in 1969, Lord Shawcross 
was still saying that developing countries were clinging to exaggerated stories of capitalist exploitation. So we have Shawcross still insisting on his points. We uh, also see that activists already had noted the importance of these people who were using economic development, they were using the rhetoric of economic development to broaden their control of the economy and natural resources. So, the, so I think that by, already by the late 1960s, you can see that the, 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 it was quite clear what were the, the, the different positions and how uh, uh, the, the rhetoric of development was being used to promote international investment protection. I mean, in the 1970s, there was a lot of, uh, uh, it was not, let's say, easy times for foreign investors because of, of the backlash of uh, trade unions of the global south against multinational corporations. But this would change in the 1980s and 1990s with, the, uh, with neoliberalism and a change of policies all over the world, including the end of Keynesian policies. So in that uh, situation, these investment treaties the, the treaty that Chad and Italy had signed in 1969 kind of boomed, and then we have in the 1990s more than four treaties were signed every week. That's a lot of treaties. Yeah. So I want to know. I have to ask you to finish up uh, in just a minute as we're we're running yeah, running yes, out definitely. of time. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So I just wanted to conclude just saying that to compare how investment treaties and 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 ISDS treat investors uh, and the idea that the promises that states make to foreign, uh, to foreign investors need to be, you know, enforced uh, to uh, the view of Violeta Parra, who is a, a famous Chilean folk singer, who says, like, who, look how smart, how presidents smile when they make promises to the innocent. So most, in most legal systems, uh, there is no, uh, it's not clear that every single promise needs to be enforced. But investors, by creating investment treaties and ISES, they have created a mechanism that allows them to enforce almost every promise that uh, governments make to them. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I got a bit longer. Thank you very much. Went. That's fascinating. Um, possibly not surprising, but obviously disappointing that we are uh, have inherited this system that is created by the uh, fossil fuel industry and from which now they're reaping benefit. Um, so uh, Jean is very help helpfully answering some of the questions for this Q&A uh, session already. Um, so I'll just try and pick out the ones that haven't been, um, haven't been answered uh, or perhaps our speakers would like to add a little bit. Um, there's a question specifically for Nicholas, and I know that he has to leave very promptly, to comment on the pushback by the Group of 77 via the Charter of Rights and Duties of the State from the early 1970s. Um, and there are, is also a question that maybe uh, Aldo could have some reflections on. Um, why don't all governments come together and abolish ISDS uh, as its public money? Um, and then there's another question also about how who who enforces the judgments, who enforces the judgment, and I, I suppose that, that could also be who enforces the, the claims. Um, so uh, does anyone want to go first? Nicholas, Maria, Aldo? Yo podría ser un... Oh, go ahead, Nicholas. No, no, Aldo, please go. Please do. Thanks. I'm going to speak in Spanish, please. Thanks so much. Um, Just a short uh, comment, a brief comment. It seems to be really obvious that having a system that uh, goes uh, above our national laws and international treaties, including health treaties, uh, the most uh, logical thing would be to abolish the system. But looking at some of the information, we need to look at how the system was built at the beginning. There were uh, Global North corporations who were bringing cases against uh, Southern uh, Global South countries. 
the 90s with the Washington consensus, whenever liberalized uh, investment was liberalized all over the world, Latin American economies were all open to investment. So we were, they were told that by, oh, by signing uh, free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties, we would attract more investment to our countries. So over time, this has been, it has shown that this is not true. This is false that these bilateral investment treaties are not uh, a determinant of uh, how much investment arrives to a country. Most of the investment that arrives to our countries are in the extractive industries, uh, oil, mining. So there was, there was always this interest So it wasn't possible uh, up until a few years ago for northern uh, countries to question this system because the tendency until then was that uh, uh, northern uh, companies uh, bring cases against uh, southern countries. But in more recent years, uh, northern countries are now also being uh, the victim or are facing uh, cases by ISDS, ISDS cases by northern companies facing the backlash of this uh, international investment infrastructure. So there's a lot of uh, countries like in, in Latin America questioning the system, but it's not easy. Ecuador, uh, Bolivia uh, left the uh, exit and denounced their, uh, their bilateral investment treaties, but they're still uh, subject to uh, to ISDS cases in relation to uh, fossil fuels. This, is, this system guarantees that if, if a company doesn't uh, meet the, doesn't comply with the ruling, uh, there can be other types of consequences. If Colombia, for example, doesn't comply with the, uh, the ruling, their assets overseas uh, can be embargoed. So there's, there's a whole system behind this. The cases, for example, in Argentina, whenever, if you don't comply with the ruling, you can be subject to sanctions internationally. Just that, thank you. Thanks, Aldo. We're swiftly running out of time on this, this very short Q&A session. If Nicholas, you have a very short response to the question, that's welcome, otherwise, uh, Oh, yeah, thanks. I'll be very, very brief. I think what Barry, Barry is saying is very important. I, I mean, so it, it, I mean, the group of 77 and, 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 and through the Charter of Rights and Duty of State they tried to push, uh, the, to put forward a different uh, way of governing foreign investment that would uh, require investors to uh, be, to respect domestic law and to submit any dispute they have to domestic courts, which is pretty much uh, uh, quite different from what we have today. Yeah, and we could talk about that for much longer, but, but definitely the Global South in the 70s had a different view of how foreign investment should be governed. Thanks. Maria, I don't know if you have a final message for the, uh, the arbitrators in the ISDS case uh, around the Bruno Mare case or anything you want to add to what others have said? You're, you're muted now at the moment. What I said before, I mean, as just an activist and somebody that really spent, you know, a good, you know, 10, 12 years on this, uh, I find it absurd that they would uh, uh, not involve the people in their decisions, that it's all secretive and hidden behind doors. And uh, we didn't even know anything about all this before, uh, you know, um, this case came to us. And um, so, again, I, I think they operate in a very anti-democratic way, and this is wrong. Um, you know, and I, I strongly suspect that the, the legislators in Italy didn't know about this or else probably they wouldn't even have decided to stop the project if they knew all this. And perhaps even the people would have not, you know, would have been less um, adamant about stopping them, you know, matter had they known that, you know, we were going to be slapped with $300 million, uh, um, you know, worth of a fine uh, just because we wanted to save our environment. Mm. So it operated in the most transparent way. Yeah, well, it's a great case for raising the profile of ISDS. That's exactly what we're trying to do with this event and uh, to call on the UK to leave the Energy Charger Treaty and to leave uh, our 
to, to drop IFDS from all of our, our trade deals, which is particularly important given that the UK is hosting COP26. We don't see a new cycle come around without some warning of the uh, starkness of the climate threat. And we cannot make the changes that we need to make if we still have ISDS. I want to hand over the last minute to Jean from uh, Global Justice Now, who's going to tell us a little bit about the day of action that happened today and next steps for the campaign. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, to end with... Um, uh, yeah, saying that we can take action around this. I mean, it is it is so revealing to hear Nicholas talk about how um, the the origins of ISDS come from uh, big oil, and now we see big oil using it. You know, back then they were worried about. Um, about uh, countries seeking their own independence and what that meant for them. Now they're worried about uh, societies seeking to deal with climate change and what that means for them. Um, we need, but also hearing how we can um, stand up against them. I, here as well, we um, have been able to um, get some coverage uh, for the, uh, the the issues of ISDS uh, yesterday. Um, uh, around on Sky News and just seeing people's reaction to that reassures me because just as Maria has just said it's wrong people get that when you tell people about it people go this is outrageous this is awful it's wrong and as Maria was also just saying this system thrives on secrecy if you can pull it out into the light if we can tell people about it if we can talk about it then it begins to shrivel up and die, basically. Um, and that is what I think we can do. So just to say, um, probably many of you who are here have already signed um, our petition. Um, I just put the petition there again. If you have not signed, please do sign the petition. This is around the Energy Charter Treaty. It's around um, the other UK trade deals that will include ISDS. Um, if you have signed that uh, petition, you will hopefully receive um, updates from us about the campaign, more ways that you can get active. Leah and I are beginning to scheme about something that we might be able to do in a couple of weeks um, at an event that the arbitration industry itself is, is holding. So if you if you are signed up to receive um, uh, campaign messages from us, um, that's that then, then we'll be telling you about that. Um, I also want to say, get active for um, the, uh, the, the UN climate conference coming up. One of the key things that we are um, saying is calling on the UK government to um, uh, exit the Energy Charter Treaty before COP. This is something that, as we've heard, Italy has left the Energy Charter Treaty. A few countries across Europe, France, Spain, um, Greece, uh, Poland, um, Slovenia, are at least prepared to consider leaving the Energy Charter Treaty. We need to put uh, more uh, emphasis and efforts and, 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 and just force the UK government to try and back down and change its mind. Um, it, 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 like I say, it's been so reassuring just in the last day, couple of days to see so many people who are um, just, when we tell them about ISDS, they go, that's broken. The world shouldn't be like that. We need to change that. And together, actually, I believe that we can because we are beginning to change it. We've heard about ways in which it's been possible to take active action at local level. If we all come together, hopefully we can actually get rid of this profoundly unjust and undemocratic system that is just helping to break the planet. Um, so yeah, that I please get active. Um, take action in your local areas, hold hold maybe a meeting. If you would look like speakers, contact us at, at, at either War on Want or at Global Justice Now. We'd be very happy to help you organise um, a public meeting or anything like that. Um, and yeah, let's try and get rid of this completely broken system. Great. Thank you, Jean. Um, with that, I'll bid farewell to everyone and hope to see you online on the streets fighting against ISDS. Thanks everyone. Good evening.